Welcome to today's webinar entitled The Global Trading Order on Course or Off the Rails. My name is Markus Kornprobs. I'm from the Vienna School of International Studies. And um, I, I am instructed by Chatham House to tell you that this meeting is on record. And uh, since we are on record, obviously Chatham House rules do not apply. Um, it's been about a year or so from now uh, that TV Paul and I started to put together a special issue, and you see it here actually in my hands. Um, it's entitled Deglobalization, the Future of the Liberal International Order. And uh, there are quite a few contributions that have something to do with uh, economics, with the international political economy, and especially with finance and with trade. Um, today, we're going to focus on trade. And uh, when we started this special issue, then we already had some kind of a hunch that um, perhaps the times in which the world was ever more globalizing, uh, that they had come to an end, or at least that they had been interrupted. Um, if we look at what's going on at the moment with uh, problems uh, with supply chains, uh, so car manufacturers, for instance, can't produce the number of cars that they want, uh, cell phone producers, smartphone, and so on and so forth. Um, that uh, seems to underlie our hunch even, uh, even a bit more. And uh, so uh, it's probably a really good idea today, uh, not just to look at this big concept of globalization, deglobalization, this big concept of international order, but to actually zoom in onto the question of trade. Um, I'm very happy to introduce to you two excellent speakers uh, who are gonna, gonna tell us quite a bit about what's going on at the moment. Um, that is Mark Brawley. He is professor of political science at McGill University in Canada. And uh, Asima Sinya, she is the Wagner Chair of South Asian Politics and George R. Roberts Fellow at Claremont McKenna College in California in the United states and um, the two speakers are going to talk for about 10 minutes each so it's quite brief we want to be as interactive as possible uh, you as an audience you are encouraged to send us questions and comments and uh, after the presentations i'll be happy to read out these questions and comments um, and then i'm going to hand them over to mark and asima um, so, um, without any further ado, then, I'm going to hand over the word to our first speaker, and it is uh, Professor Mark Brawley. Mark, you have the word. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you for including me in this project. It's been interesting to see the, the work that everyone's done. Uh, my own contribution uh, focuses a bit more on monetary relations, but what I try to do is draw out some longer term patterns from past experience that we've had with liberal international economic orders. Um, I may disappoint your, your uh, audience here a little bit in that uh, I don't start off with a, a supposition that uh, we've got a, a clear picture of what's happening right now. In fact, I think the easier way to look at things is a bit as you hinted that we're at some kind of a crossroads with the liberal international order that uh, indicators of economic activity suggest globalization had been proceeding fairly consistently up to 2008 and that the financial crisis then uh, sort of made things plateau. And the real question we were all posing, as you pointed out a year ago, was sort of, will 2020 and the pandemic cause things to move more clearly towards deglobalization? As I said, I, I focus on liberal international monetary orders. And so I do want to highlight a couple of differences there from trade. But what I was trying to do was draw out some theoretical interpretations that we can make from prior experience. And there are two really popular views. Perhaps one is even more popular within the experts in international political economy. And 
the more popular view uh, looks at the bases for cooperation in the system and looks at the benefits from things like trade, the mutual benefits that participants uh, can draw from this and suggests that there are reasons why once you get it established, liberal international economic orders tend to proceed for long periods of time. Now, historically, the picture's up and down, right? If you looked at either the monetary order as I did, or if I had done this with the, with the, the trade order more specifically, experiences have fluctuated. It hasn't always been a clear, steady progression over time. But the underlying sense of this really popular argument is that because trade creates winners on both sides, at the national level at least, you're going to wind up with a sustainable system and one that the participants want to see continue. Now, an alternative kind of older argument would stress the need <clears throat> for a leader in the system that when crises do occur, you need some kind of stabilizing force. And that stabilizing force tends to be a really strong, powerful country that sees benefits in having the international order, the liberal international order continue. And here's where we can start to draw up one of the distinctions between say, the monetary side of things and the trade order. Because when we look at the monetary side, one of the key features is the presence of an international medium of exchange a money that everyone can use internationally. Now that helps everyone who wants to participate in markets at the international level, having one means of payment that everyone will recognize. But if you're the country that provides that money, so the United States currently, Britain back prior to World War I, that one country that's issuing the international medium of exchange draws special benefits both special benefits economically, but also political benefits because you have this ability to impose financial sanctions that are gonna be more effective than anyone else's uh, economic sanctions. So uh, that leads me to perhaps look at the, the leadership side as being much more important when we talk about past experiences with liberal international monetary orders and why they survive crises and why they don't. Now, with the more recent crisis in 2008, and then again, the one in 2020, uh, a couple of other things have emerged as being quite important. And one of those would be domestic inequality and how much people within states think about the source of inequality as arising from a liberal international economic order. And that may be really even more powerful when we look at the monetary side of things again, trade and money both affect uh, what's happening inside states obviously, but also people's perception of how those things affect their job prospects, levels of unemployment and so forth will vary uh, from country to country, but also as I'm trying to say here, from the monetary side of things to the, the trade side. Um, and I think people think about the sources of inequality different, but uh, I'm, I'm willing to hear other people's opinions on that and, and listen to people's questions. The one thing that came through though, between the 2008 crisis, and now we've seen it again in 2020, is that when one of these crises arises, Governments have the tools to kind of step in and fix asset markets fairly quickly, or at least cause those markets to recover. That's probably a better way to put it rather than fix, since we could all talk about what's wrong with financial markets, but um, they cause those markets to recover at a much more rapid pace than they do with uh, the real economy. You know, unemployment tends, tends to be a much stickier problem than uh, crashes of the stock market. With 2020 in particular, but also with the 2008 crisis, we have signs on the monetary side of leadership by the United States. 
of the U.S. undertaking some sort of policies to help stabilize not just their own internal markets, but also the broader international financial system. Not so true on the trade side. In 2008, yes, I could point to a couple of things that I think would underscore American efforts to stabilize the international economy more broadly. It wasn't their first instinct, it wasn't Americans' first instinct, but they did it. With 2020, uh, much broader difference uh, between what they do on the monetary side, where the Federal Reserve takes a number of unprecedented actions to help central banks elsewhere, which also happens to reinforce or reassert the dominance of the US dollar. And that's in, in contrast to what they do on the trade side. On the trade side, uh, you don't see nearly as much leadership. And in fact, we could, I'll, I'll listen to what Asima has to say on this. Um, but it leads you to think a little bit about those two arguments, right? If, if a liberal international economic order is really self-sustaining because everyone feels like they draw sufficient benefits from it, then why would we see variation? between the experience on the monetary side versus the experience on trade. If we're looking at leadership uh, as well, the role of the United States as a leader in the international system, then again, we see a little bit of variation there. Um, and we can, we can perhaps talk about that in the question and answer, why there would be this difference between the American response on monetary relations uh, versus what we saw on trade. Uh, but that leads me to be more optimistic, the evidence that we've got so far, about the future of the liberal international monetary order, that that looks like it's going to uh, survive these bumps in the road, these crashes, and remain in place going forward. But I do then have more doubts about whether the liberal international trade order will survive the future intact. So I'll, I'll finish with those thoughts and I'll pass it either back to Marcus or over to Asima. Mark, thank you very much for a great talk. And uh, all I'll do is I'm going to hand the word over to Asima. Asima. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to International Affairs for inviting me and for I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, and I also wanted to make a plug for all the other articles uh, in the special issue. Um, you know, I take a perspective. It, it, it's actually really nice to go after Mark. Uh, I'm taking a perspective which is more uh, about the WTO and how it functions. But the other articles, and including Mark's paper in the special issue, uh, raise a complementary perspective. So I would urge the audience to go and... Um, you know, uh, see the whole issue and other articles. So I really liked what Mark said um, and hope we really can have a discussion uh, later on about the comparisons between monetary and trade. Let me just get to my argument and maybe it will have some uh, suggestions about what, you know, the comparison, what does it look like? So essentially in my article and I, what I try to argue, I look at the uh, crisis at the, the trade crisis from the perspective of the World Trade Organization. Uh, and we know that trade order is being modified from within and without, and it, rep it is represented by tariff wars, uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, domestic uh, perceptions about trade have changed. And uh, uh, people within the United States, um, actually, this is not necessarily true of um, emerging powers, but the leading powers, people have become more cautious. But in addition to these trade wars and domestic changes, there is also a change or there is also a crisis at the World Trade Organization, which is the representative body representing the liberal trade order. So it, this raises a puzzle. It raised a puzzle for me, which was essentially that um, if the, as Mark mentioned, if the liberal international order is supposed to be self-sustaining and the World Trade Organization as an organization that mo monitors and manages trade is supposed to play a role in it, um, why did the crisis at the domestic level then uh, spill over at the international level in terms of the World Trade Organization? Um, and so this 
the, there is another additional uh, point here, which is that the World Trade Organization is one of the most uh, considered to be a strong international organization. It is considered to be strong because it has a very well-functioning dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, it has a set of rules which have been agreed to by many parties. It, um, and so the, I, the question emerges, why did the WTO face this crisis? So I'm going to tell a little, say a little bit about what this crisis represents. And I introduce a distinction between what I call a crisis of institutions versus crisis within institutions. Uh, and my the basic idea here is that trade is a distributive issue. It always generates conflicts. So from, you know, um, there is, there are, it's, a, it's almost like a bargaining gap, a, a bargaining game between winners and losers. Um, but around the time, uh, 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 you know, in 2000, especially 2008 onwards, it became a crisis of institutions. So what does the crisis of institution mean? It essentially means that there's a crisis about how the rules are functioning. Uh, second, the ideas and purposes of free trade, what Mark mentioned in terms of perceptions about free trade have changed. And there is greater challenge to those ideas of free trade, that free trade can be beneficial. The first perspective, again, that Mark mentioned. And then the legitimacy of global trade organizations is in question. So these three elements, created what I would call a much more systematic crisis of institutions. The underlying factors were, were uh, the rise of emerging powers who began not necessarily to challenge multilateral rules, but they became more active at the WTO using especially Brazil and India. China actually is um, not such a revisionist power at the WTO, which is an interesting uh, uh, point to note. So the emerging powers began to be more active. They began to actually use multilateral institutions to in, increase and enhance uh, trade liberalization. And that created a, a, created a phenomena that the United States, the leading power, uh, began to realize the WTO, that, that it will not get its way um, at the WTO. And it began to retreat uh, and move, move towards bilateral deals. So the, so the underlying reason for the crisis of institutions was this activism of emerging powers and the role of the leading power to retreat a bit uh, and ad adopt alternative methods, what are called in, uh, uh, by an uh, author as outside options. Now, in my argument, this crisis of institution um, reveals an underlying tension at the heart of the WTO between representation and representativeness and effectiveness. So the, it, is, it may be surprising to the audience that the World Trade Organization has been vilified a lot, but actually is an extremely representative body. It's a member-driven body, not a secretarial-driven uh, secretarial body. The size of the membership is about 164 countries. Uh, there is a norm of one country, one a vote. Uh, it has a very representative heavy procedures which have become more representative as developing countries and emerging powers have begun to play more of a role. It operates by consensus and the developing countries have become stronger. So these very representative heavy procedures and norms have created a challenge for effectiveness. That's the paradox, which is that actually when WTO was less representative, it actually was producing comprehensive agreements, of course, dominated by the leader uh, and or, 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 uh, or you know, shaped by the leader. So the, the, as the WTO has become more representative uh, and more coalitions like the G20, the Africa group have emerged, um, it, has, um, it has created problems for effectiveness. So, so what is the, how are the emerging powers in the United States, um, you know, dealing with it? And I think Mark is completely correct that the liberal trade order is in more trouble than the liberal monetary order. And uh, what is interesting is that the emerging powers are, have learned to use the WTO. They've actually learned to use the dispute settlement mechanisms. They have liberalized. So it's essentially on the side of the emerging powers, it's a crisis of success, as in they are, um, they, are, um, they are much more, they are defending reform multilateralism, although in, there is contradictory policies at the domestic level. 
and um, they are wanting the WTO to function more at this stage. This is true for India and China. Uh, and uh, contrary to other, um, you know, uh, other governance institutions, China is not a revisionist power. It actually is following the lead. And this came out in another very interesting article by Christian Hopewell as to how European Union is playing more of a role at the WTO rather than China. So the emerging powers are, uh, they are seeking, they are using the WTO to craft their own rise uh, onto the global system. And the United States, as this tension between representation and effectiveness has become stronger, the United States is uh, withdrawing because its hegemonic role in the uh, WTO is not benefiting it, or that's what it perceives it to be. Although there are uh, examples where the, w the United States actually has benefited uh, in terms of the dispute uh, cases that have come up. So this tells us that while the WTO was, uh, was supposed to make the system self-sustaining, it does have a power dynamic under, uh, underlying it. And when the power begins to shift, the leading power no longer defends the rules of the game. And so as the norms, paradoxically, as the norms of the free trade spread, uh, the, uh, and they began to constrain the leading power itself because of activism at the w at different elements of the WTO, uh, the leading power began to withdraw and has created, uh, as, as partly really uh, created the uh, crisis of rules of the game, challenging ideas of free trade. The United States currently defends sovereignty norms in many fora at the WTO uh, rather than free trade. And also the larger legitimacy of WTO as in question as a combined effect of both uh, what the leading power is doing and United and, and, and emerging powers. So in, in the end, what I want to just conclude is that the retreat or the, the um, or the crisis of the liberal trading order is taking place on two uneven legs. It is creating new winners and losers um, in that sense that emerging powers actually want to make the WTO work. Uh, and, uh, but it is also creating new ways of managing the crisis. So in my estimation, we are seeing the liberal trade order as a moth eaten order, which is parts of it are working. We are uh, generating smaller agree agreements at the WTO. And so fragmentation is accompanied by some attempts to reform the, the World Trade Organization. So the future is that the, in, in my judgment, and you know, we can discuss it with Mark, uh, I think the WTO will survive as an organization, but it is being made and remade both by developing countries, emerging powers, and the US withdrawal um, and you know, it, from the uh, from defending the rules of the game, there will continue to be small agreements, uh, and there will be focus on capacity building. Actually, the World Trade Organization has been very active on the COVID front, um, and the other important news is that EU has taken a lead to uh, uh, to suggest a multi-party interim appeal arbitration agreement as a substitute to the appellate court uh, dispute settlement, which has been under crisis because both the Biden administration and the, uh, of course, the previous Trump administration have not uh, renewed uh, the appointments at the appellate court. So the WTO will survive, but in a, it's a moth eaten organization. I, I don't think it's going to die, but it, there are certain questions about if it can survive in the same form. The, the form of course has changed because the participants, because it's a representative body, the participants have transformed its purposes and its structure. So I'll stop there. Asima, thank you very much. Um, I have, uh, I'm, I'm having a, a very, a very good situation here now because I have no questions yet from the audience. So I can ask you questions. But before I do that, but before I do that, let me encourage the audience again. So whatever comes to your mind. Um, uh, please ask, and, and I'm going to read the questions then um, to the presenters. Um, I have three questions, and I think three, the, the three questions, they apply to Mark and to uh, Asima. And uh, I greatly enjoyed uh, 
the com complementarity of the talks because there was the finance and there was the trade and obviously the two hang very much together and nevertheless the dynamics are a bit different. Um, so my, my first question is, um, you both talked about leadership. And uh, so Mark basically alluded to hegemonic stability. So one state uh, being interested in setting the rules, therefore setting uh, the rules and making sure that compliance happens. Um, and Asima, you used the word lead state several times, so also uh, went into that kind of direction. So my, my first question would be, in finance uh, and in trade, um, would it be possible to have something like a concert of powers? So, uh, so, so, so great powers cooperating with one another and leading together. So that would be my, my first question. And obviously one could think then in terms of what's happening at the moment, would that be, would there be a chance for the United States, China, uh, other important players of the European Union to, to cooperate together? The second one is um, about the relationship now between the financial order and the, and the trade order. Um, so there my question uh, for Mark would be, so if, troubles in the trade order continue, could that spill over, so to say, to the financial order? Could it make things more troublesome in the financial order? And therefore, uh, Asima, the, 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 the other way around. So in what ways uh, can successes and failures uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the financial order have repercussions uh, for the trade order? And... Um, and my third question is about something that one may call background knowledge or taken for granted beliefs. Uh, some more critical scholars may call it ideology. Um, what about these, these, these far reaching consensuses? Uh, Asima has, uh, has alluded to one of them, uh, free trade, for instance. So this, 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 uh, not that long a time ago, there was actually quite a far reaching agreement, say a decade ago, it definitely was still very much there that free trade is actually a good thing. Um, and uh, everyone profits from that in one uh, shape or form or another. Uh, by now, so the Trump administration probably reminded us of that quite clearly, but I mean, we have this resurgence of, of, uh, of mercantilist thinking or, or however you want, one wants to call it, or economic nationalism. Uh, in many parts of the world. Um, what kind of role does that play? And, and perhaps how is that likely to play out in future? So are we, are we likely to have this contestation about the most fundamental foundational principles uh, about finance and, and trade? Or, or is, that, is that likely going to subside again? Maybe we're going to go in the in the order in which you presented. So that would be Mark first, and then Asima. Great. I think those are some interesting points uh, to talk about, and um, they actually would relate to a few things. I want to build off of what Asima talked about. First thing I have to say, though, is I like the the idea that we're going to create a concept here called moth-eaten international institutions. <laughs> I'm, I may steal that from you at some point. Um, on the notion of concert, uh, you know, can you have like a condominium leading a, an international, a liberal international economic order? Um, theoretically, yes. And it's a lot easier to see how you do that with trade. Because in trade, it's easier to construct compromises where you are creating domestic interests that complement each other. Um, and in fact, uh, I'll, I'll try to get to that point in just a second about what the WTO was supposed to be about. Um, with monetary relations, it's harder because there's a tendency within markets to uh, force choices, basically. Like when you're talking about an international medium of exchange and uh, you have one currency that's clearly the preferred one for everyone to use, that makes great sense. Can you do this by 
you know, through a bilateral or bipolar arrangement, a second currency there. Uh, I'm going to say it's really hard to do that because individuals on the markets are constantly going to be choosing between the two. You can, you can figure out ways to cooperate for sure to try to maintain two currencies, both relatively attractive for people to use and to hold and so on. But there's almost always going to be a, a tendency for everyone to gravitate towards one, which means getting rid of the other. There are some theoretical models that say if we have three and the three currencies have different characteristics, then you know maybe you can come up with some system that won't be uh, so uh, vulnerable to fluctuations. But it's just going to be, I think it's harder to see how that's going to work with monetary relations easier to see with trade. And I'm, I'm going to bring this back to some things that Asima was mentioning. And um, the way I would have put uh, a lot of the themes that she uh, discussed, uh, the way I would have put it is that the WTO emerged from the Uruguay round negotiations as a series of compromises, where the three main groups each basically walked away saying we won on two issues and we lost on one. The US went in to those talks asking for liberalization of agriculture and services. The Europeans and the Japanese went in asking for dispute settlement mechanisms to be improved, mainly as a way to constrain the US and for liberalization of services. But they didn't like the notion of liberalizing agriculture. Developing countries as sort of the third block went in saying liberalization of agriculture looked attractive, but they also wanted dispute settlement mechanisms improved. They didn't really want liberalization of services. But the promise that came out was we would have liberalization of agriculture, services, but also the improved dispute settlement mechanisms. But when you look at the current situation and you say, well, what have we delivered on this front? Agriculture got liberalized a little bit, but not a whole lot. Services got liberalized, and the dispute settlement mechanisms were definitely improved, but now you're getting pushback from the United States in particular about how the dispute settlement mechanisms work and shouldn't we have alternatives? And as Asima pointed out, this is consistent across Republican and Democratic administrations in the US. So the kind of compromise that everything was founded on was never really delivered. And then uh, it's basically coming undone as interests are shifting between the different parties. Now, do you want me to take on another question or do you want me to pass it over to Asima? <laughs> I need instruction. Mark, whatever you want. Whatever you want. So any of those okay. questions that 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 strikes your fancy, you go. Then I'll, then I'll just then I'll just build off what I said to make a slightly different point, which is that part of the reason, uh, or one of the more intriguing things about why the United States uh, has domestic interests shifting in this way that is making free trade a contested idea and sort of challenging the role of the WTO. The way I just described things, one of the big winners from the WTO's practices over the last 20 or 30 years has been services. And US financial services in particular have done quite well, thanks to changes that are rooted in the WTO. But if you look at domestic politics in the United States and you ask yourself who is for free trade and who is against it, finance just doesn't appear in most of the discussions. They're very quiet about all of this. They are not out there as a proponent in Washington, DC of the WTO or of you know, what's happening, you know, defending the liberal trading order. They're just not active participants in that, that whole lobbying scene or, or coalition building within the United States. So it's a little bit of a, a a mystery, I suppose. Um, it may be that they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to draw attention to themselves. That's sometimes a wise 
political strategy when no one likes you a whole lot. Um, but it is, it is surprising given how successful they've been internationally. So I'll, I'll stop there and let someone else have a chance to talk. <laughs> Mark, thanks very much. Asima. Um, so yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for the, uh, I, I liked what you said about the WTO, although I do disagree a little bit. Um, you know, my perspective on the WTO is, and so I'll respond to Mark and then uh, get at your questions, Marcus. Um, I think it is, I, I, I completely agree with you, Mark, about how uh, the, uh, you know, it was supposed to be a compromise between three issues uh, when the when the WC was formed in 1995. Um, and I have this idea that that was the intention, that was the, you know, organized intention, especially of the services industry, actually the pharmaceutical industry, uh, you know, the intellectual property rights also was an important part of, of those, uh, you know, agriculture services, and you mentioned um, uh, dispute settlement, but intellectual property. So it is true that at the leading powers level, those were the compromises, and they wanted the participation of developing countries on all of those. Uh, but I think what happened is that the World Trade Organization is an organization in motion, and what I mean is that it actually changed the interest of, uh, and the uh, and also the capacities of many developing countries. So for example, I'll give you an example from India. In 1995, India was resistant to the World Trade Organization. It didn't even, you know, it was, it was completely opposed to almost everything about the World Trade Organization. But by uh, when it loses a dispute settlement case in 1998, and that in the early 2000, it begins to accept uh, and there is an unintended trade liberalization, even in terms of purposes and uh, notions that is happening inside many of these developing countries. China was, you know, it it came willingly to the WTO in 2001, um, but it so it does transform itself uh, and uses its trade uh, and global advantage to begin to use the WTO to its benefit. Um, so the so the whole design of the WTO is being adapted uh, by all the participants. Now, let me get to what Marcus asked me, which is about leaders, the first question. I agree with Mark that a kind of a concert of leaders may be difficult, especially in trade. And uh, let me give an example of a previous period when some kind of a concert was possible and it happened as a result of uh, issue linkage. So, for example, soon after September 11th, uh, George W. Bush, uh, you know, given the security and the cha challenge of terrorism, he used that framing uh, to link between the Doha round and trade issues um, and conceded a lot to the developing countries. So there was an issue linkage between security and trade, and that allowed a larger encompassing kind of a uh, you know, uh, agreement to take place. Um, so if the Biden administration is able to make an issue linkage between its attempts to craft a coalition of, de of democracies, you know, the Quad and the Arcus and all, you know, so it is Biden administration is trying to craft a coalition of democracies against China. And if it is able to link that with the trade gains that it could you know that it, that could happen in uh, at the WTO. Then there is some possibility of a uh, alliance between you know the the, the that, that the United States would uh, come up with a reform of the WTO, which is agreed to by e Europe and other and especially developing countries. So the issue linkage uh, is kind of the key here. And the, currently, the Biden administration is seeing. Um, it, it's its leadership role, you know, in terms of uh, a contradiction, which is that it wants to create this coalition against China, and it sees at almost every forum, it sees, you know, no overlap because these uh, China and other powers have become more active in these global organizations. So the the again, theoretically, a leadership concert or a combination of alliances between different powers is possible on trade. Uh, but it is being undermined by a lack of an issue linkage uh, between the security concerns where 
an attempt, a zero sum kind of a alliance pattern is emerging and, and trade does require the kind of compromise that Marx spoke about. Um, should, are there any questions or should I, I can pause a little and... <laughs> I think that there are questions. There are okay, questions, good. but if you, yeah. Um, and let me uh, so I'll, I'll summarize. There's three of them, and one of them is for Mark, and two of them are for Asima. Uh, the one for Mark, just uh, to to make it a bit briefer. Um, that's uh, so. That there's a there's a question. What if China would introduce a digital currency? So we're moving towards digital international relations here. Uh, so what would be the repercussions of such a move? So what potential impact would that have on the US domination uh, of the global trade and finance system? That's the question. And, uh, and I'm just gonna uh, follow up with the two other ones and they are for you, Asima. Um, that is, uh, there is a question about Russia and the World Trade Organization. So what role does Russia play in the crisis faced by the WTO? What is its position and strategy to promote its interests in this context? And, uh, and the other question uh, is, um, yeah, it's also about trade. Uh, so I just read it, is there a difference in vision for the multilateral trading system that makes it possible to reach consensus. If the emerging members are unwilling to accept new obligations and a special and differential treatment, is the payoff insufficient for the more established ones? And perhaps we're gonna go again in the, in the order in which you presented, it would be Mark first and then Asima. Mark and Asima, if you wanna uh, read the um, the questions uh, yourself, you can do that too. Just click on the, the, yeah. the questions and answers button, right? Yeah, Mark. Great. I, I'll, I'll take uh, the question regarding the Chinese RMB and China's intentions there. And I'm going to split it slightly because uh, the issue of a digital currency is a little different than just the broader point here, um, though there's definitely a connection. Uh, the notion that the Chinese would actually like to have their currency be used as the international medium of exchange um, is not, uh, it's something that they're, that the leaders within China often refer to, not all the leaders there, not all the authorities that govern monetary relations, but some of them talk about this. Uh, but on economic grounds, it's not something that you should expect to see anytime soon. Uh, to have a currency serve as the international medium of exchange, you basically have to make it very attractive to people. And that attractiveness rests on a couple of features. One is that you believe this currency is going to hold its value for the future, not just the short term, but for the long term. The second is that you have to feel like you can spend this money easily. So having free trade tends to be associated with issuing the international medium of exchange so that foreigners feel like if anything else, they can at least go to that country and spend the money. Uh, a third thing is that you have to have kind of a track record for managing this money responsibly and uh, that involves having a well-developed legal system that outsiders can recognize and use and so forth. So on sort of every dimension that you look, China's not actually very well positioned to make the RMB a useful international medium of exchange, right? They, they don't practice free trade. They don't have open capital controls, meaning it's not easy for your average Chinese person to actually take money out of the country. Um, they don't have a good track record as far as how they manage the money. They uh, don't have a, a transparent legal system where foreigners feel like their rights will be respected. Uh, they don't have a, a market um, where people can freely buy and sell uh, 
financial instruments that are that are denominated in RMB, where that market would be really wide, meaning lots of participants, but also really deep, meaning lots of volume. And, and on all those scores, the US has uh, the edge and is likely to have it for a long time going forward. On a much more simple basis, to make your currency attractive, the usual thing is you have to make it appreciate in value. You have to make it uh, look like something you want to own as opposed to some other foreign currencies. And China's done really well over the last 20 or 30, 40 years in trade by having a currency that's routinely somewhat undervalued. It's not necessarily undervalued at the moment, but historically speaking, you know, having a currency that's relatively undervalued means your exports look cheaper than they otherwise would and your imports look relatively more expensive. To get rid of that policy, to say we're going to push the RMB to, to be uh, you know, quite valuable and something people want to hold and so forth, would undercut China's export performance. And it just seems like something that is unlikely for them to do. Now, why are they even talking about it? They're talking about it for something that's in the written version of the question that came through, which is this notion that the dollar is currently dominant and that gives the US certain political privileges, right? One of them is when the US says, we don't like you for whatever reason, we're going to impose some kind of financial sanctions on you, which makes it very hard for you to use the international payment system that everyone participates in. Because parts of that payment system, the US can exercise sovereignty over. So freezing Iranian assets in the United States or blocking Russia from being able to, to process payments through the normal banking system. Those are forms of power. And you know, China, just like Russia, Iran, and others, they don't wanna be underneath that power. So they are uh, thinking about and exploring ways to create an alternative payment system. It's less about economics and it's much more about politics. And in fact, all the countries that are, that not all of them, the main countries that are experimenting with digital currencies are countries that are thinking about how do we kind of get ourselves away from uh, US dominance of the financial system. So there's a clear kind of political um, connection between this whole discussion and uh, uh, what states are trying to do. Now, the only other thing I'll say real quickly, just to take up the other question that's there about a, a vision for the multilateral trading system and sort of where we, we headed. Uh, the issue I think rests with the building resistance or the building opposition in the economically advanced countries. And for me, that has to do with poor trade adjustment. That, you know, the, if you think in the United States about who are the winners and losers from liberalized trade, I've already said, I think of international finance, you know, people in New York making very big salaries. They're the winners right now. And the losers are people who are on the opposite end of the education spectrum, living in rural America, who are losing jobs in old manufacturing industries because of competition from uh, the emerging countries, right? The economically developing countries. And the US just does a really bad job of figuring out how to spread the gains from the winners and reduce the losses of the losers. And they need to work a lot harder on that. Um, and that might also be equally true for some places in Europe. But I'll, I'll let Asima get in some words now. Asima. Yeah. Um, so to the first question, um, the question is about, is there a difference of visions amongst the emerging powers and the, multi and the you know, um, leading powers about how the benefits of WTO will be distributed amongst them. Um, I completely agree with Mark that uh, within the United States, there is now been unraveling of that vision because the uh, delivery of 
trade liberalization has uh, not proceeded in an equalizing ma manner within the uh, you know, United States. And so United States is retreating as a result of that winners and losers divide within the United States. Now, in the developing countries, the winners and losers are different. Actually, there are more winners currently in many of these countries than losers. And so developing countries are... Um, you know, uh, wanting greater stakes in uh, the uh, WTO and, lib and the liberalized trade. The question is an interesting one. It asks about if the emerging members are unwilling to accept new obligations uh, under special and differential treatment, and that refers to the least developing countries. And what, what I would say to that is that for a while now, there has been quite a lot of agreement that the de least developing countries want capacity building. And they do want some, you know, some of their um, export subsidies and all to be accepted on the WTO rules, uh, but they want capacity building to, to be able to negotiate and to improve their customs regulation, which is a requirement of the World Trade Organization. So they are not opposed actually to the vision of the WTO, they want capacity building. I think what has happened is as a result of the domestic distributional conflict within the US, the US is not willing to um, you know, deliver on the promises that were made into, uh, uh, under the ages of the World Trade Organization. So the, 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 the contradictions that have emerged in the so-called vision is because of changes within the United States. And on the other side is um, that the winners and losers in developing countries actually are now towards wanting more li trade liberalization under their own terms. You know, every country wants uh, to modify liberalization, trade liberalization on their own terms. Even the United States, it uses agricultural subsidies, uh, anti-dumping duties. So every country wants a combination of free trade and some protectionist measures, including the United States. So there, I don't think there is as much a contradiction between developing countries and the US, except that the US is now withdrawing. The other thing I would say is that this relates to the larger theme of the journal uh, special issue. You know, deep globalization pressures of uh, protectionism and within uh, leading countries, but have created uh, externality, which is that uh, there's a domino effect that uh, while it is true that there are more winners in developing countries, they are also adopting self-reliant and protectionist policies almost as a, mim a mimicking mechanism. And so every country is now uh, you know, putting, raising their tariffs. Um, and that creates a serious problem for the vision uh, of free trade. So there is, the, and this gets back to Marcus's question about consequences. Despite intentions, even if there are supporters of free trade in developing countries, the consequences are going to be, um, you know, a greater erection of um, barriers and, uh, and the deglobalization pressures are going to have a spillover effect, you know, even without, even beyond the intentions of the actors. Just quickly, one thing on Russia. Uh, Russia became a member of WTO in 2012. And I haven't seen much activism by Russia at the WTO. It has not been very active in the many of the meetings. And I suspect that because WTO is now, its, it's legitimacy is being questioned. Some of the attention of uh, Russia is being diverted to other forums. Uh, at, at least I haven't seen, you know, I haven't, I, I don't do, do research on Russia, but I haven't seen any activism by Russia at WTO or, or an alliance between its security strategies or balancing or counterbalancing the US at the WTO. That's what I would say. Thank you, Asima. Um, I have now three more questions. And I know that in terms of time, we're almost out of time, but they're very good questions. I nevertheless um, want to read them uh, to Mark and Asima. And, and perhaps the two of you just answer one or so of them, but very, very quickly, okay? Um, so the first one is, will the United States continue to be an essential player in the global economy? Second one is, in the context of an increasingly deglobalized world, are there any routes out of the WTO crisis of representation and effectiveness? And the third one is what are the political implications of a monetary order dependent on US leadership 
and a trade order that is now functioning in spite of US withdrawal? All three of them very simple questions. Right? <laughs> and we have really something like, like a minute, uh, Mark and Asima, um, a minute each. Great. I'll, I'll start. <laughs> Just um, excellent questions. And uh, quick thing, yes, the US will be an essential player in whatever liberal international orders exist in the near future. Um, because of the size of its economy, its, its technological lead, et cetera. Um, and I don't see the U.S. withdrawing completely from any liberal international order. Uh, it's, it's trying to reshape things. It's done this in the past, as it did in the early 1970s with uh, the monetary order. It, it reshapes the rules as, as things evolve. Um, political implications of the U.S. being dominant in finance and sort of withdrawing from trade. Big, big connections there, possibly... Um, Marcus asked a question about this, which I didn't answer. In the 1930s, when trade broke down with the Great Depression, it meant you couldn't make international payments very easily. You couldn't earn money to pay back debts. So these two things are definitely related and will remain related for economic reasons, if not political. Well, right, thanks. Thanks a lot, Asima. So yeah, uh, on the first question, I agree with Mark. Um, and on the second question about how will the challenge of representation and uh, uh, representativeness and effectiveness be solved, in November, December of 2021, uh, WTO is supposed to meet to discuss the reform. And uh, currently, by the way, the USTR is on her way to uh, a G20 meeting to discuss some reform issue, uh, issues regarding WTO. Um, if there is, if the you, EU is able to involve the United States in a reform of the uh, dispute settlement system, uh, then there are some chances that the WTO will uh, be able to solve. So, the, so will be able to solve the, the issues. Um, but I think the WTO as an organization needs to come up with mechanisms to address the effectiveness gap if it is able to involve all the parties and, the, and that would be the challenge. It is quite representative and it you know needs more but it i think the challenge is now on effectiveness and they are dis discussing in november december some proposals to uh, discuss the reform and if those if anything comes out of them then there, there is more hope otherwise we can go back to a status quo asima thanks a lot uh, thanks a lot actually uh, to both of our speakers today thanks a lot to mark thanks a lot to asima uh, it was a great discussion i definitely learned a lot I'd like uh, to thank the audience as well for asking excellent questions. And uh, if anyone wants to read more on these and other related issues on deglobalization, the future of international order, please have a look at our special issue. Thanks a lot. Uh, good evening, Mark. Have a nice rest of the day <laughs> and bye-bye.